Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Microsoft licensing wor uh, workshop for non-profits. I am so pleased to be here this morning with one of our fabulous sponsors, Cloud Direct, and with Pete Murphy, and with all of you who have been able to join us. Now, at Charity IT Leaders, we know from all the conversations we have with our members that Microsoft licensing is one of the topics that is one of the most vexing, shall we say, it should, in theory, be relatively simple. It never is. It's always more complicated than you think. And I suspect that a lot of organisations are not getting the best value from the licences that they've got or have even got the correct licences for what they want to achieve. So we are hugely lucky today to have um, fantastic experts as well as our sponsors, uh, Cloud Direct, who are going to be sharing their very impressive range of knowledge and expertise with you. But also Pete will be staying on the call right until the bitter end to answer any questions that you might have had, any thoughts that might have come up during the presentation. So I really can't stress enough that one of the main things we want to get from this morning, once Pete has gone through the slide deck and shared some information with you, is to have a really in-depth conversation about the biggest challenges that you're having with uh, your licensing because Pete will be able to answer I would think pretty much anything you can throw at him and uh, no no pressure there Pete <laughs> but if he can't answer anything straight off the bat then um, we will come back to you with answers on those after the workshop. Uh, so just for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tree Hall and I'm the CEO of Charity IT Leaders and we are ourselves a charity supporting the sector in getting the very best from digital technology and IT provision. So we work with a lot of organisations, large and small across the sector, lots of different types of organisations. And really, we are a place for people to come and network, to collaborate, to have a rant about the things that are, are challenging and vexing you um, and just to, to share and get the best from each other and from this fantastic community that we all work in. If you're not members, uh, please do reach out to me after the event because we'd love to get more people as part of the community. Membership's just £600 for the year and that's for your whole team. And you can find out more about us at charityitleaders.org.uk. But it's not me that you've come to listen to this morning, it's Pete. So I am going to hand over to him now and he will talk you through Microsoft licensing leading up to our Q&A and conversation at the end. So Pete, thank you so much for being here this morning. Thanks for the intro, Tree, that's great. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, the content that, that we've come to kind of share with you and talk to you about is kind of Microsoft 365 licensing. Um, I'm assuming that everybody on the call either has or is looking to get some form of Microsoft licensing. Um, so we're, we're trying to dispel a few of the myths. We're trying to help you to understand what you've got, what you are paying for, or intend to pay for, and more importantly, how you know what you need, um, because some of the information can be a little bit conflicted and a little bit confusing. So just to introduce myself, I am the Modern Workplace Practice Lead at Cloud Direct. So pretty much responsible for all of our work with Microsoft 365. So from uh, licensing and implementation, migration onto the platform and involved in our, our managed services as well to make sure people are, are supported within that environment. This isn't going to be a, a hard sales pitch or, or an introduction to Cloud Direct. Um, but just to show you kind of where we sit within the Microsoft partner ecosystem, um, we are independently audited and certified by Microsoft. So we've got a lot of solution partner designations, which are the, the highest level of, of partnership that you can get within that ecosystem. Um, we were also the first UK Azure expert MSP. So not on the modern workplace side, but in our Azure practice, we were the first company in the UK to attain the top level accreditation with Microsoft on that front. Um, and we've got partnerships with other other organizations such as Citrix, VMware and, you know, uh, ISO registrations for for those kind of things. Um, we've got Cyber Essentials auditors, so we're quite well placed to talk about many, many aspects of IT, um, but our specialism really is uh, in the Microsoft ecosystem um, where we, we hold pretty much every designation that we can hold, with the exception of Dynamics, where we don't have a, a specified practice for that at this time. Now, 
getting into the, the content a little bit and how we at Cloud Direct look at modern work and Microsoft 365. Uh, what can be quite confusing, um, particularly on the Microsoft side, is the range of products that are included within a license, the range of things that you have got access to. And as Microsoft's marketing engine earns its keep, they keep changing the names of things as well. So that's kind of our job as, as experts in the field to, to try and keep up with that. When we talk to people outwardly, we try and distill that into what we call the pillars of modern work. So this is centered around uh, a user's identity, um, around the devices that people are using, the data that we're holding, how we communicate and collaborate with each other, both internal to an organization and externally with partner organizations and the applications that we're using. All of these pillars are covered by a Microsoft 365 license. And at the same time, we've got a security strand which runs through all five of those pillars, which is why we don't call it out individually as, a, as an additional pillar, because we believe it's central to everything an organization does. So every one of those five pillars can, can lean into security and compliance. Now, the way that we look to, to utilize these pillars is to take people's use cases and their requirements and map them into these pillars. By and large, most conversations that we have with people touches on all five of these pillars in one way or another, but it enables us to start to, to um, ensure people have got the right licenses and products to cover how their organization works at a high level. The way that we do that internally um, is we have devised what we call the Microsoft 365 engagement and realization framework. Now, Microsoft as a whole, they've got uh, various frameworks to do with infrastructure and migration, well architected frameworks, cloud adoption frameworks. There's nothing specific to the modern work area. So we've devised this, which comes along the same paths as all of those cloud adoption frameworks, takes the best bits out of the, the industry wide frameworks that we've got available to us uh, and allows us to apply that to a modern work scenario. Um, so what we're looking at here is obviously the product set is Microsoft 365. We've got an engagement phase, which uh, which maps onto other frameworks as assessment and planning. We've got a realization phase, which is where you actually gain the value for, from the work you're doing. And the framework is just how we bolt all of that together. So just to give that a little bit of a bit of further context, if you like, um, the, the engagement phase, obviously assessment and planning. This is where we start to look at discovering what you've got, discovering what's available to you, making sure you fully understand what you've got available and how you can best utilize those tool sets. Um, and looking ahead as well as part of that engagement phase, you have a license, you may not be able to use all of it now, but you want to set uh, steps in place so that further down the line, you can fully utilize that, that commitment, that investment and, and understand what you're getting. And then the realization phase is around how you implement those products, how you get the most out of your investment and how you operate that ongoing. So how you make sure you stay up to date, you stay supported and you're continually looking at getting the value out of that money you're paying for that investment. So that's kind of the framework that we've got and I'm not going to dwell on it for too long. But in terms of the agenda for today, we have very much set this into two sections. So we've, we've got a, a section around the engagement and then we've got a section around realisation as well. Um, and there will be a five minute gap in the middle. Um, so I'll let everybody take a, a quick comfort break and grab a drink if they need to. So in terms of the engagement section, um, what we're looking at here very much from a, a licensing perspective is helping you to understand what's in those licenses, what options you've got available to you for licensing as not-for-profit organizations. And also, how can you start to understand whether you've got the right license, what you want to be doing in the future with those licenses, and when you should be looking at, at stepping up and, and moving things forward. So if we get straight into the, the content for this, because I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, but ultimately, within not-for-profit at the moment, we're, we're looking at, at four main options for purchasing your licenses. So regardless of what type of license you're looking at, at getting or what type you've got, um, you can either just go and buy those directly from Microsoft. So if you are eligible for not-for-profit pricing, you can get that kind of added to your tenancy. You can go onto to the Microsoft portal and you can buy your licenses. You can, you can put in payment methods and they will provide them to you directly. If you've got over 250 uh, licenses at Business Premium or E3 um, or above, 
you can get an enterprise agreement. So you can go to a Microsoft partner um, and you can ask for an enterprise agreement um, and those licensing bodies will be able to, to get that for you. And that comes with some additional benefits. If you want a flexible solution to licensing, there's the CSP agreement. Um, so you can go to a partner, you can get a CSP agreement, which allows you to flex your licensing up and down. Um, and coming in November of this year, not-for-profit and education licenses will be added to the new commerce experience. So this came out last March, uh, March 2022, for uh, kind of enterprise and corporate customers. And this is kind of a halfway house between a CSP agreement and an enterprise agreement. So it gives you a bit of surety over 12 months that you can lock in things like pricing, um, but it, it takes away an element of the flexibility. So um, just to go into that in a little bit more detail. So buying from, from Microsoft, um, you can obviously uh, are subject to minimum term commitments. You can be quite flexible with your numbers. You are subject to Microsoft price increases. And you, you have to, if you get problems with the, uh, with the service, you're reliant on Microsoft support to answer those. When you get into the, the CSP model, where you're buying from a Microsoft partner, um, and there are different CSP models, but, but that's, that's kind of by the by, as that partner is providing you the licenses, uh, we would have a responsibility to, to kind of provide support on top of those. So by sitting in between yourselves and Microsoft, we can give you a bit more support than you would potentially get going straight into their service desk up front with the benefit of our uh, experience um, and expertise within those partner organizations. With the CSP agreement, it is flexible. You can increase and you can decrease your, your license numbers at any time, um, but they are subject to price increases. So if Microsoft announced a price increase for October, then th those prices will rise in line with that. Where the new commerce experience comes in, it's very similar to a CSP agreement, but it's designed where you've got more stable user numbers. You can lock in a minimum number of licenses for a period of time, so typically 12 months. Um, you can increase numbers at that price point within that window, um, but from the point of taking out the NC, you've only got seven days to reduce or remove that commitment, and then that minimum term is locked in for 12 months. There are pricing benefits to locking that in for 12 months. So typically it works out that if you do commit to NCE over those 12 months, you pay the equivalent price of 10 months on a CSP. So there are there are benefits to doing that. Um, that isn't confirmed for, for the not-for-profit at the moment, but the expectation is it will be a very similar agreement to what's currently in, in for enterprise. Um, and it gives you the chance to lock in prices at the beginning of the agreement for 12 months. So if you know you're going to use a product in those 12 months and there's likely to be a, a price rise during that time, then you can buy one of those licenses right at the outset and pay for that and then increase the number when you need to. So again, you get some benefits from that, that commitment. Um, again, provider support included. So if you do have uh, an NCE or a CSP, the, the licensing partner that you've chosen to use has a commitment to yourselves and to Microsoft to, uh, to solve those problems for you where they can. Um, then enterprise agreement is for stable or rising user numbers. So an enterprise agreement is a multi-year agreement, typically three years, but that locks in the price that you get at the outset and keeps you at that price point for those three years. Um, so there, there's a, a benefit there to a longer term commit. You can only decrease your seat numbers at the anniversary of that agreement. So on the on the annual kind of renewal point, you can choose to decrease numbers of certain licenses if you want to. You can increase at any point. And with the enterprise agreement, there, there are additional uh, benefits available to you. Just on that, because obviously we're, uh, there are some some great uh, benefits to, to not-for-profit licensing, um, just wanted to show the, the kind of eligibility criteria. It is relatively simple but I, i'm aware that some people do sometimes not quite qualify for not-for-profit uh, benefits in, in terms of this um, but if you're registered um registered charities or hmrc exempt then you should qualify for not profit not-for-profit uh, price points which are beneficial in comparison to uh, enterprise prices uh, and gives you some, some real uh, good benefits as well um, so just moving past that, uh, you may be aware that there are some changes coming to not-for-profit licensing um, in October. So uh, historically, 
Office 365 E2 licensing has been available to charities for no cost whatsoever. And that is being uh, sunsetted, as Microsoft call it in their own terminology, from October the 1st. What that means is that at your next renewal day after October the 1st, those licenses will cease to exist within your tenant, um, but they will be transferred to a chargeable Office 365 E1 license. The, the thing to be aware of with this is that those will automatically carry over and they will automatically renew and it will be the amount of licenses you've got available within your tenant not the amount of licenses you're using so the graphic on the right hand side of the slide here at the top line shows that you've got two licenses in use but you've got 25 available so it's the it's the 25 which would be chargeable at that point and um, so it's very important that you're aware when those dates are going to be and you know that you're not going to be liable for a cost once that flips over to a, a chargeable um, license. And as part of that, we need to make sure you know how many licenses you actually need and have in use, and that you've got the right licenses and functionality available to those users once they switch to new license types. Just a little bit on enterprise agreements. Um, so, if you are on an enterprise agreement, if you do qualify for an enterprise agreement, there are some additional benefits which you might not be aware of. So you can get those E1s for free on an EA for frontline staff if you if you qualify for that licensing. Uh, you can also for every E3 you buy on an EA, you do get entitled to Microsoft 365 F3. So you can have two of those for every E3 to use for your volunteers and supporters. In order to qualify um, for an enterprise agreement, you need a minimum of 250 users on what Microsoft term their, their core product. Um, but you can lock in prices for, for three years, as we've mentioned before. Um, if you want to go the CSP route, that is more flexible um, than an EA. Um, you do get the benefits of, of partner assistance um, as your agreement isn't directly with Microsoft, um, but you know there, there are benefits to each of those agreements. So it's best to, to consider your options there. Um, but also when you are on an enterprise agreement, there are other benefits available to you, such as Dynamics 365 licensing, Power Apps licenses, and Azure Consumption Credit, if those things are useful to your organization. So that's a little bit on purchasing options and what you've got available to you. Uh, next, we're going to go and have a look at what you actually get within licenses. So in terms of understanding what you are actually paying for, um, there's a, a, a couple of uh, queries that, that we often get asked, as in what's the difference between a Microsoft 365 license and an Office 365 license? What's the difference between a business license and an enterprise license? What's included with those commitments? Um, so the resource that we've got at the bottom of the screen here, which is a, a m365maps.com, is a, a really valuable resource when looking at licensing. On that, you can see all of the licenses available. It's updated regularly and it shows you what products are included within each of these licenses. Now, it's not an official Microsoft resource, um, but it is maintained by a Microsoft employee. So it's about as close as you could get without being officially released. And it's absolutely invaluable to these licensing conversations. Now, when we look at these these maps of, of what's included in the license, each of the little boxes on the screen is a separate product and it should click through to the service definition for each product as well. So you get some really valuable information out of this resource um, and it, it really does help you to, to know what you've got available. So just to answer a couple of the, the questions that we often get, in terms of the difference between a Microsoft 365 license and an Office 365 license, they both provide you with kind of your, your core Office apps. That's the Office 365 part of it. You get storage within both of them. What the Microsoft 365 bit does for you, which Office 365 doesn't, is gives you access to the enterprise mobility and security suite. So the things which really help to secure your business, which push you on a, a little bit further in terms of that security and compliance bit, data governance, understanding how to secure your environment, is all included in the Microsoft 365 license. Also included in there is Windows licensing, so you don't have to go and procure that separately either. So you're getting the security suite, you're getting the office applications and you're getting the Windows licenses all within that one bundled license. You also get on-premise usage rights. So if you have an active on-premise domain, 
and you want to move all of your emails to M365, but you want to keep an, uh, an exchange server on premise for management purposes, you get the rights to do that as long as you're not hosting those mailboxes. You also get defender products within those licenses. So again, just to increase that security suite, within the Microsoft 365 suite, you get things like Defender for Endpoint, which allows you to use antivirus. And there's things like that that we will cover later in terms of how to realize the value of these licenses. And you get some seeded premium products. So we have got some information about some of the premium products, which sit just outside of the Microsoft 365 licenses. But part of those products do start to show value within the licenses themselves. So you get certain pieces of functionality within that. Now, this is an example of one of those maps for, for the business premium suite, and the next slide is, is for the E3. So you can see that there are things included within here, um, which are absolutely useful. And you can see how it maps out what's available to you within each of the, within each of the, the core concepts. So within business premium, you've got your Office 365 products, which includes all of the exchange licensing, all of the SharePoint licensing, all of the things you'd expect within that Microsoft product set. In the middle column, it tells you quite clearly what you get access to within enterprise mobility and security. And on the right hand side, it shows you the Windows licenses and even the Defender for Business to, to give you that antivirus and, and kind of anti malware um, things that you may be paying for with other providers. Again, similarly on the E3 section, we've got um, the same the same concepts, the same product sets. You get a little bit more with E3 in some aspects and you get a little bit less in other areas. But again, on M365 maps, there is a comparison table as well. So you can go in, you can select the licenses that you're looking to see between, and you can see the feature comparisons of them. So it is a, an invaluable resource when we have these kinds of conversations with people. Again, particularly uh, with customers we've worked with in the not-for-profit sector, we get questions around what is included um, between a, an E3 or a business premium license, but also then the, the F3 licenses um, for, for frontline staff. So um, the, the major difference between them is that the F3 license is scaled down, so it doesn't hold a lot of the product sets that are in the E3, but it is designed for those people who aren't sat at a PC, who aren't sat with a desktop available to them. So if we look at the, the comparison um, in terms of what they've got available to them, we can see things like they've got a reduced ability to use OneDrive. So they've only got two gigabytes as opposed to the terabyte that a normal user would get. They've got smaller mailboxes because they're not designed to be within emails all day, every day. They've got SharePoint Online Kiosk, which doesn't give them as much storage, but it gives them the functionality of the platform to consume data. Um, and that there are just uh, things like that, and they don't get the office applications to install on desktop, but they get them for mobile devices because that's what's expected of frontline workers or volunteers. They'll be able to access these things on the web or via mobile devices, and they can still be perfectly functional. In terms of how you make the most of those uh, licenses and what you're using and kind of understanding the, the position within your estate and how things are going, um, we've got a few bits that are available, a few options. The first thing is that built into the Microsoft 365 admin portal, there are usage reports and what's known as the adoption score. So within, within the reports section on the left hand menu within the admin center, you can get access to the usage reports, you can get access to the adoption scores. There's also Power BI reports available that you can download and you can connect to your tenant and you can see things with a bit more detail. Um, one of the things that we often find is that people have a lot of licenses which are potentially inactive. So running checks on what is Azure AD currently, it seems to be called Microsoft Entra ID, um, but running checks on there for in, invalid, not invalid, um, inactive users um, and understanding where your licenses are, where you're potentially keeping things active for the wrong reasons, um, such as somebody's left the organization, you still need access to their data, so you keep an active license. You can track those kind of things with last logon dates and understand exactly how people are using those things. We can also track the, the next two things, the things that Cloud Direct offer. So with our customers, um, and I imagine other partners do the same, they like to do tenant health checks just to understand from, from our perspective, to give you that little bit of value, to understand what's currently in use, what could be utilized further, and how we can start to to help you to, to consolidate that investment and to make the most of, of what you're spending. So 
we've got two levels of this. The health check is a high level overview where we can look at the licenses that are in use. We can look at the, the security configuration and we can understand exactly what is being used from within that. And we can make recommendations on how to better that. The assessment is a bit of a lower level piece of work where we can actually then go in and we can help you to set baselines and we can help you to, to understand from kind of end to end within the ecosystem, how people are logging in, how people are using those tools. Um, and, and we can make recommendations for kind of the roadmap moving forward to, to better utilize or to better invest in, in different license types if that needs to be done. One of the other things that we need to make sure that people are doing in terms of usage of these tool sets is making sure that they're on top of their security and compliance posture, their key tools. So things like multi-factor authentication, conditional access policies, making sure that the, the scope of the policies is correct, that everybody is being protected and it's not in a pilot mode. Um, and similarly, checking things like secure score and compliance score to take out the, the recommendations that Microsoft put into those tool sets that you've got access to just by having the license. So just for a couple of examples of that, the box on the left here is a usage report for uh, Microsoft 365. So you can hover over the graph. This is from a demo tenant, which is why the, the usage kind of tails off on the right hand side. Um, that's not because people have stopped using the product, but you can see at any point you can hover over one of those days and you can see how many people are using different parts of the tool set. So you can definitely get a gauge on, on how well utilized your, your product is. There's a lot of other reports on that page as well, a lot of other metrics. So you can see where the most popular tool sets are and you can also see where people aren't potentially adopting things so well. On the right hand side at the top here, we've got a, a snippet out of secure score, which tells you how to increase the security within your, your tenant. So you're, you can start to utilize those licenses. Some of these things may well have a third party product in place at the moment. So it says require multi-factor authentication. Some people may be using a product such as Okta to do that. So it's not being reflected within these stats, but it can help you to start to identify where you can potentially consolidate onto the product set or you can address your concerns with what you're doing um, and, and understand exactly what your, your ecosystem looks like. And the bottom part here is from the adoption score. So it's showing you where, where Microsoft are noticing by way of the telemetry that they're collecting, where potentially your tenant could be better utilized from a productivity perspective, by you could get people to work with that tool set better and to better understand kind of trends and how people within your organization are interacting with the technology and where there's potential training needs or communication needs in order to get more value out of what you're doing. In terms of trying to understand which license you actually need um, within your organization, it, it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, but there are a few questions that we try to go through with people to understand exactly what they're doing. So the first one, how many users do we have? Um, there's a secondary question to that is in terms of what roles are they doing and how they're interacting with the systems. But at the outset, if you've got less than 300 users in your organization, the chances are the business licenses rather than the enterprise licenses are going to be more cost effective and you're not going to lose a whole lot of functionality. So the main differences between a business license and an enterprise license is that the mailboxes are 50 gigabytes instead of a ter uh, instead of 100. Um, and that there's a bit less storage space in, in certain areas. But in terms of functionality, by and large, you can do everything within a business license that you can do within an enterprise license. So that's the first question we ask. We can then go into what functionality people actually need. This can be a differentiator between an E3 license and an E5 license, for example. Um, but, you know, we very much need to understand what tools people are using, where they're using them, what's covered within a base license, what could potentially be an add on license and getting the best mix of licensing to, to provide that functionality for people. Sometimes it's also about looking at third party products which are outside of the Microsoft ecosystem. Now, there can be very valid reasons for hope for you know, investing in other systems. But there could be savings elsewhere by standardizing onto the Microsoft platform. We've helped customers in the last year save many thousands of pounds where they've been paying twice for the same functionality. So it's been included within their Microsoft investment. They've had a third party product doing the same thing because that's the way it's always been done. But when they look to consolidate that, that either brings a cost saving into the organization or it justifies an uplift in Microsoft licensing to provide additional functionality for the same level of investment. 
We can also look at where other systems potentially integrate with Microsoft. So if you're using a, a CRM or you are using a product which is core to your line of business, can that integrate with Microsoft? Can you make your processes quicker um, by utilizing what you've got in that Microsoft license? So things like single sign-on where you can use your Microsoft identity with other elements, things like that can produce efficiency. So it, it's included within your license, it can potentially make things easier across the board. Also, do you work with other customers on the same platform? So over the last few years, Teams has become commonplace for collaboration between organizations, making sure you're covered to do what you need to do with customers, with partner organizations, whoever you need to, to be working with to make sure you've got the access right, to make sure that you can do everything within the Microsoft platform that you need to in terms of data sharing, in terms of collaboration, and that you're not having to then go and procure other tools such as Zoom or whatever that needs to be to, to make sure that's happening. Um, you know, it, it's all part of that decision as to, to which license you want people to be to be utilizing and the security and compliance features that come with that can, can play into that decision. And then we need to look at what are your aims for the next one, three, five years, potentially even further afield. The product set is always changing. If you're looking to uplift your licenses, these things take planning, preparation, and actually knowing when you're going to have to make the investment to make that the right thing to do for your organization. What we've seen particularly in, in kind of corporate enterprise establishments over the last 18 months is that when new agreements come in for licensing, they've locked in a price on a higher license than they were currently using for 12 months. They've committed because they've seen the benefit of getting that lower price point. But 12 months down the line, they haven't actually done anything to realise that investment and therefore they start to, to backpedal and they start to drop down the licensing levels because they haven't got the benefits of that investment. So although it seemed like a good deal up front, those uplifts, in order to make sure they land and to make sure that you get the most out of those, those investments, they really have to be planned in advance. You need to know when you're going to step up and you need to make sure that functionality becomes a core part of your business. So it's all about planning. In terms of maximizing the return on investment, and this is this is something which is, is kind of really important to us at Cloud Direct, is making sure people are getting the value out of those investments. Um, it's around consolidation. It's around making sure that what you're paying for is getting utilized. So the question we often ask is, what are you paying for twice? And I've mentioned that already with things like Defender for Endpoint, which covers your antivirus, it covers your anti-malware. People are often paying for a separate antivirus solution. You get things like Defender for Office 365, which covers your mail hygiene, phishing protection, uh, anti-malware via, via mail, safe link, safe attachments. People are often paying for mail hygiene solutions elsewhere as well. We get a lot of these, these kind of things, you know, Zoom, telephony, these kind of elements which can be part of the Microsoft ecosystem that people are paying for independently. And we, you know, we want to make sure that, that people are getting the most out of what they're paying. Similarly, increasing usage absolutely does help with maximizing that investment. So where people have got your security and compliance uh, in place and they've got a, an easy way to connect, an easy way to do their job and they, they know how they can utilize the tool set most effectively, then that makes, that, that makes your investment much more worthwhile. If people are just logging into Office in the morning and they're, they're writing a few documents and they're saving them somewhere, then that's not going to be the most beneficial way of utilizing your Microsoft 365 license because there's a lot of things within that tool set which can protect data, it can protect your users, and it can enable them to work better. It can enable them to work closely with people, it can enable them to communicate, and it can enable you to communicate outwardly with those employees to make sure that they're engaged, which they may not be getting the benefit of. Similarly, because the tool set is so wide ranging, because there's things in there which can help you with low no code development, you can start to, to build out processes, standardize those processes and automate common tasks. So you've got those things available to you. They're included within the license. If you start to utilize those, then you can get efficiencies within the business. So it's not just reducing your expenditure elsewhere, but it's making the most of the expenditure that you've got within the Microsoft 365 stack. And we can't uh, emphasize heavily enough how important training is. There are parts within MS Learn, there are things online, 
there are elements within the Teams application itself where people can get quick one minute videos to learn how to do things better. And by highlighting these things to people, enabling them to, to make their usage of the tool set more important, it just makes it a, a better uh, experience for all concerned. So once we know what licenses we've got, we know what we're looking at and we know that potentially there are things that we can we can look at increasing our investment to, to make better use of the Microsoft tool set. Um, we can look at, at when you should step up and I've touched on this briefly already, um, but this is about making sure that you've maximized your current usage. So if you're currently on an E3, make sure you're using most aspects of that E3 before you start looking at the E5 functionality, unless you've got a specific use case. You also need to have a plan in place to increase usage. So there are certain products which will which will push you towards that uplift. Is it better to just take a an add on to get that functionality rather than stepping up the whole license and giving yourself a larger overhead? And there does come a tipping point where you've got enough add ons that buying the, the, the combination license or the, the single license is better than the combination. So examples of that that we see around Power BI, around Teams phone, um, and some of the security and compliance add-ons as well. So a lot of people, or some people, not so much these days, a lot, but people would historically have had an Office 365 license and they'd have bolted on some of the security products. There comes a point where they're paying for enough of those add-ons that a Microsoft 365 license becomes beneficial. Once they've got a Microsoft 365 E3, they start to bolt on some of the additional E5 features independently. And again, there's a tipping point where financially it makes sense to just buy the E5. There are products within E3s, E5s, which we've touched on already, which could you know, warrant consolidation. So potentially any uplift in license financially could be cancelled out by savings you make with other products. Um, and then the bottom bit is something that I've just mentioned on the previous slide, which is only increase that licensing with a plan to utilise those tools, implement and to get them adopted. So. For most people uh, from a, a sales perspective, they will be labouring the benefits of the top level licensing. They will be labouring the benefits of an E5 and the security and compliance that's included within that, which is all well and good, but you have to know that you're going to utilise that before you commit to that investment. Just in terms of licensing, which is outside of, um, outside of the, the, the core Microsoft 365 licence, there is now uh, the Viva suite, which was released uh, late last year, early this year, around employee experience. And we've got a bit of content on that coming up. The Intune suite, which was released early this year, um, which is around advanced device management. So it gives you some of additional capabilities in terms of managing those devices and making sure that you're secure. We've got Teams phone. Um, so bringing telephony into Teams, taking you off any outstanding platforms you may have, any desk phones, et cetera, and getting people to be more flexible with how they use telephony. But similarly, in 2025, the ISDN network is being shut down. Um, so that, that could be calls to, to move into a, a more modern telephony solution. Windows 365, which is a, a cloud PC provisioning, so you can give people a license, spin up a device in the cloud that they can connect to from anywhere for a uniform experience. Um, and then something which is creating quite a lot of, of buzz at the moment, which is Microsoft Copilot. Um, so we can talk about that a little bit later as well um, at a very high level. In terms of looking ahead, um, it's just about understanding what your aims and objectives are, understanding what you've got available to you, looking at security and compliance, um, looking at your endpoint management. It's something that we are finding uh, a lot of people asking questions about at the moment. As a result of the, the pandemic a couple of years ago, a lot of people have bought and shipped laptops all over the place to all kinds of people. And now they're trying to take back control over what people can do with those devices from a security and compliance perspective and from a licensing perspective. It's something which is integral at the moment to, to a lot of people's kind of aims and ambitions over the next few years. Cost optimization is, is always key, particularly with kind of not for profit sector, with what people are looking to do. We understand that every penny that is being spent on technology needs to, to yield a return of some form. So making sure that we can optimize those costs and then Copilot, um, it's about readiness at the moment. So making sure that where those new technologies are coming down the track, um, where they can potentially be of value and benefit to organizations, that you are positioned well to take advantage of those technologies. So that's just one example where something is coming along 
which could potentially change the way people do their jobs um, and making sure that we, we've got you know, the, the forward facing view on that to understand exactly what we want to be doing with that technology. We'll take a five minute break now um, and we will come back just after quarter past 11. So I'll speak to you all soon.
Welcome back, everybody. I make that roughly five minutes, so we will carry on with the, the content now. Um, so this next section um, is more around the, the realisation part of, of the framework that we presented earlier. Um, this is how you can actually start to, to kind of make use of those licences to, to understand what you're doing and to start making the best of some of these these elements that we can suggest to you for, for kind of realising your investment and for, for consolidating those costs and for really just making sure you're not overpaying for things that you aren't using, I suppose, um, but making sure you're utilising what you are paying for. So one of the things that, that we find is kind of critical to licensing um, is the identity management piece. So we know that Microsoft 365 licensing is based on a user count. You are paying for the number of users that you actively need to give a license to. So in order to make sure that you're only paying for those people that need to have a license, identity management is critical. But it's also key to security. It's also key to compliance, knowing who's got access to your data, knowing who's got access to parts of the, the you know, the life cycle of, of users that you've got and, and what you're trying to do. So People use an identity to log into pretty much everything, applications, devices, data. So what is your master identity? Is it based in Microsoft? Have you got another identity provider? What do you want to be doing with those people? How do you want them to be managing themselves? From our perspective as a, a Microsoft specialist, we very much want people to be using Microsoft as their, their master identity. We want um, AD or Azure AD to be that, that kind of cornerstone of everything that you're doing. So making making it that it is absolutely critical to to how we would like people to operate. We understand that's not always possible, but using that master identity to give people a way to simply, easily and securely access all things that they need to access to do their job is what we want to do. Now, in terms of life, in terms of the licensing, that identity life cycle is absolutely key to making sure that people have got what they need to do their job and that your investment is at the right level. So we're talking about joiners, movers and leavers processes. Um, some of that can be technical processes. Some of that is absolutely business process. Um, and we need to make sure that when somebody is joining an organisation, moving between roles or leaving an organisation, that the processes in place allow for that to happen. So it makes sure they've got what they need on day one. It makes sure that if they move from one role to another role, that they can they can change how they're accessing things. They potentially would need a different kind of license if they move from one area of a business into another. But making sure that those processes are in place to make sure that the, the correct investments are being made, but also the operational benefits of those licenses are being realised in those roles is, is really important. And similarly, when somebody leaves your organisation, you don't want to be paying for them to have a license months and months after they've left and gone to work for somebody else. You don't want to be keeping those accounts active for longer than you need to. And we need to make sure that that process again is exactly what it needs to be so that you're protecting data that you might need that they may have had in their possession. You're cutting off their access, absolutely. But you're also not overpaying for things that you don't need to be overpaying for. So that identity management piece is, is key there as well. One of the things that we look to do, um, which has not always been a, a default or a standard, but it's absolutely best practice from our perspective, is group based licensing. So within Azure AD, you can create groups and you can assign licenses to those groups. So by virtue of being a member of a group in Azure AD, a person gets a license. This kind of backs onto things like role based access. It gives us the ability to simply and easily manage what people have access to. We can use those groups for many things. But licensing, it gives us a really easy way to say, well, actually, we want to upgrade this group of users from an E3 to an E5. We can take them out of one group. We can put them into another group. The other thing we can do as part of that is we can turn services within that license on and off. So from an organization perspective, just because a product is included within a license set does not mean you want to give everybody access to that functionality. You may not feel comfortable allowing everybody in your organization to start spinning up workflows in Power Automate or applications in Power Apps or developing Power BI dashboards. So you can turn things off within that license set that you don't want people to have access to that you may pose a security risk unless you can govern it effectively. So until such time as you're happy 
to let those people have access to those pieces of functionality, you can turn it off at a group level. That means that you don't have to go into every user's record and turn that service off. You can just do it once at the top level. You can create another group for allowing people access back into that service so that you can roll it out at your, your leisure and with your levels of comfort. There's a, another bit about identifying dormant users. So there's a difference with inactive users. Some people will absolutely have left and you may not want to be paying for them anymore. Some people may have taken a sabbatical. They may be on long term sick. They may be on maternity leave. There, there are different reasons why people won't be logging in actively. So, you know, if you are pulling reports from the Graph API, for example, to, to pull out inactive users and, under, you know, it doesn't have to be an automated process that you then just shut those people down. There can be tags that you can apply to them within Azure AD. You can put um, attributes on their record which says, yes, they're not going to be logging in, but we don't want to shut them down yet. So it's about identifying those truly you know, dormant users or, or levers that, that you don't want to be licensing anymore. Similarly, there could be a reason if somebody's not going to be logging in that you could move them to a cheaper license for the period of time that they're not going to be there. So there can be cost savings attributed that way as well. Can you automate the processes? So within Azure AD, within Microsoft Entra, there is uh, user lifecycle management. You can, you can hook your HR system up into Azure AD so that that join as move as leave as process can be automated somewhat. Um, you may not want to trust the system fully. There are still some checks and balances that you would want to put in play, but you can make that much more efficient. Um, and similarly, you can have workflows that do run at a central level, which can check for, for dormant users. They can produce reports for you or they can they can disable sign ins on those accounts so that you can go and do those checks and make sure you know who's using what. Obviously, identity management, there are risks to having identities in the in the cloud. There are risks to, to having this access from anywhere at any time on any device, which is so beneficial and flexible to us from a, a working operational perspective. But if we don't get that levers process wrong, it can leave the doors open to people that have left the business or people that um, are kind of malicious actors could have access to the, through those accounts, which could go undetected because that user won't notice they've been they've been targeted if they're not logging into the system. So identity management is absolutely a key part of running the system, but it's also key to making sure your licensing investment is reflected as well. In terms of products consolidation, um, what we are what we're looking at here is making sure that what you're paying for with the Microsoft license isn't just a duplication of cost elsewhere. So do you know what you have in terms of alternative products? Are you running something along the lines of Mimecast? Are you running Kaspersky uh, antivirus? Are you running McAfee? Do you have backup solutions? What alternative products have you got and why are you using them is a really important question to be asking yourself. Feature comparison is really important. We're not saying that Microsoft has the best tool for every purpose. Absolutely, they have good tools for those purposes. Um, you know, they're often seen as a market leader. They're often in the magic quadrant in Gartner surveys, Forrester, Forrester surveys, for example. They get good marks, but nobody is going to come out apart from potentially Microsoft themselves and say they've got the best tool for every job. We know there are justifications for alternative tools, and if that's there, that's absolutely fine. That feature comparison part is key when you're looking at product consolidation. Um, and then when you understand exactly where you are with those products, what you're paying for, why you're paying for it, and, and what investment you want to maintain, it's about planning that migration to realize the savings. There will be contract end dates, which you're already committed to. There will be investments that you have to make um, in order to make the migration. It's not like you can just turn off one service and turn on another one. It needs to be configured within the Microsoft ecosystem and you need to be confident that that move is the right thing to do. So looking at proof of concept, pilots, testing and then patch migration, you don't want to turn a service off that's protecting your entire organization and turn another one on the next day and hope that all's going to go well. We want to make sure that it's a risk averse process and you know what you're doing. Um, and ultimately, the, the key point of, of product consolidation is what Microsoft call do more with less. So they're saying, we don't you don't have to spend money in multiple areas. Just make the most of what you've got. 
So the next few slides I've actually taken out of a Microsoft slide deck to run through with you. Um, so this shows kind of what Microsoft's um, vision is on do more with less. So typically from uh, a lot of perspectives, people have a lot of different systems which are performing a lot of different functions. Um, Microsoft claim that you can get up to 60% savings um, by moving to Microsoft 365 from all of these different solutions. Um, I'd say that's probably optimistic, um, but there are definitely savings to be had from moving a lot of these solutions into one area. So in terms of what Microsoft 365 offers you, um, we're talking largely about secure collaboration. Now, the security aspect is, is, is fundamental to that. Um, but we're talking across um, different kind of pillars, similar to what we had earlier. Microsoft has defined collaboration slightly differently. So they're talking about having devices that meet the requirements of the job, operating systems that are secure and easy to manage because they want everybody to go onto Windows 11 soon. Um, they're talking about the security and compliance management aspect and then enabling that collaboration. So when they're talking about do more with less, they're pushing products to the forefront of that can enable you to do that without having to look for third party products. So they believe that they can provide you a device, an operating system, the security tools um, and the management of those tools to enable that seamless collaboration and to get rid of then redundant solutions. So that's what we're talking about in terms of consolidation. Now, across a survey from, from Forrester, um, Microsoft have published the, the total economic impact of this, saying that they can reduce spending on devices through BYOD. BYOD isn't suitable for everybody. Um, it causes a lot of headaches with Cyber Essentials Plus at the moment. Um, but there are cost savings to be made if you don't have to provide devices to people who are, you know, frontline workers that can utilize their own mobile phones or tablets. If you don't have to provide devices to contractors or volunteers or people that are coming in to do a job for you, if you can allow them to use their own devices, that obviously provides a, a saving for yourselves. With utilizing kind of cloud device management, um, and this is across Intune, Windows Autopilot, you can get efficiency savings, decreased configuration time. You don't have to get a laptop back into an office, image it and track, send it out again. You can do these things remotely. You can reset and deploy images, uh, laptops, uh, and you can, uh, you can, gain benefits that way and through the security stack you know you can eliminate help desk tickets through things like self-service password reset by giving people the ability to do things themselves using the security tools you can gain efficiencies through your licensing in that manner rather than just the the outward costs of, of doing those things so also through the, the increased collaboration, um, Microsoft are estimating that you can save 60 hours per user per year through utilizing those applications effectively um, and 25% on travel and expenses by doing things online because Teams is set up to allow you to do that um, in a much better way than potentially was previously possible with things like whiteboards, um, with things moving everything online. Um, it's definitely saving people a lot of time, energy and expense. Similarly, when we're talking about consolidation, um, there's some examples here um, of where Microsoft 365 E3, when um, fully implemented um, and configured effectively for your organization, there's no one size fits all, but for your organization and enabling you to work effectively, where there, there's definite savings to be had in terms of operational costs. But on the right hand side is kind of the, the, the really important bit here, through those consolidations, this is where Microsoft are picking up what they believe to be those 60% savings. So through moving things away from Zoom or WebEx, from moving things away from Slack or file sharing with Box or Dropbox or whatever those things may be, by moving your device management solutions from AirWatch or Mobile Iron and utilizing what's in an E3 license, then there's an estimated saving there of $55 per user per month. Obviously, this isn't at not-for-profit pricing, um, but, you know, the, the percentages should be similar. Um, I'd say that, that, again, ambitious, but there should be things available for you there if you're using these kind of products in a, by utilising the Microsoft equivalents as part of your investment. Some of the things we touched on earlier, um, you know, outside of the, those core licences, 
We've got things like Microsoft Viva and Copilot, which we've got a few bits we can show you in a second. Um, moving telephony into the flow of work, um, understanding what that ISDN switch off means for your organization in a couple of years time, getting ahead of that curve and making sure that users that need telephony have still got access to it is absolutely something that, that, can, that can bring benefits. Um, Intune suite for device management. So improved device analytics. You can start to spot problems with devices before the users potentially know it's happening. You can remotely support them with use of that license. It enables you to log on and support them and it improves application deployment, which I think every Microsoft partner is aware is one of the biggest weaknesses in Intune at the moment. We've got a virtual desktop and Windows 365 where you can replace legacy RDS solutions. It means you don't have to maintain on-premise infrastructure anymore. You can run these things out of Azure. You can run them from anywhere. People can get access to those things. And then we've got the power platform where you can automate business processes, gives you a real opportunity to look at where you can improve those processes and you don't have to be a techie or a coder to develop these things. They're low, no code platforms, predominantly no code, if we're being honest. Um, and you can, you know, you can improve improve how you're operating and make things work smoother and faster with those things. So I'm just going to quickly go through a few bits on Viva and Copilot as the, the kind of newest elements of, of the modern work ecosystem that, that people may not have seen much information on. Um, and then we'll, we'll go to the Q&A in a sec. Um, so just from uh, a Viva perspective, um, so over the past few years, realistically, the workplace has changed. People are working more remotely. And people are feeling less engaged with an organization. Um, now, what we're trying to do with, with Viva, what, what Microsoft have, have pushed as an employee experience platform, um, is to get people to, to feel more connected, to understand more about what they're doing within the organization um, and, and to prioritize what they're doing. So there's a range of tools within the Viva suite, which is, is designed to do exactly that. So to get people to feel more engaged, to get people to have more insight into how they're working, um, and to get feedback on what they're doing. Um, and the ultimate aim of that is employee retention. So what Microsoft have, have, have claimed um, in the last couple of years is that a lot of companies are aware of employee experience. They are aware of, of things like employee feedback, of communication, and people have got tool sets in place to do things like that. But it's not a joined up comprehensive system. So that's what's trying to be pushed out. Um, is one system to, to make employees feel like they are part of something that they are, are actively being listened to um, and that you know, we can consolidate those other investment, uh, other invested tools into one cohesive uh, experience for the employee. So from the, the surveys that have been um, carried out, um, it's claimed that only 15% of employees worldwide feel engaged at work, and that's a, that's a massive, uh, you know, a, a massive stat to, to throw out to say that 85% you know, of people don't feel like they're engaged with what they're doing day to day. Um, engaged employees are highly likely to stay at that organisation. Um, recruitment is far more expensive than retention. Um, it's a it's an onerous process, and with the amount of people in kind of the, the great resignation last year, it's been exceptionally difficult to employ people um, and to keep them, you know, in employment. So, making sure that you've got highly engaged employees is important, and it also makes them, you know, more profitable according to these surveys. So, what employee experience is trying to do is it's trying to put people at the centre of everything that's happening. Uh, and then it's trying to provide insights and well-being. Um, so understanding how people are thinking, how people are feeling. It's trying to provide learning and development, pushing content out and making sure that people understand what they're doing. It's building purpose and alignment so they know where the organization's going and where they fit in with that organization. And it's providing culture and communications. So, you know, your, your historic typical intranet potentially isn't doing the right thing anymore, but targeting people with resources, with news, with events, is going to give them a, a much better feeling, a much more personalised outlook, and it's providing knowledge and expertise, whether that be people within the organisation that have worked on certain things, whether that be documents and content, that are, it's just making things easier for people to find to make their job easier. So again, 
this this slide i'm not going to dwell on it for too long but it just shows how across multiple uh, roles within an organization there are multiple things that people are looking for across these elements and this is what is trying to be pulled together with microsoft viva to give people an outlook to give people the, the engagement that they need and the experience of, of knowing you know exactly where they fit within an organization and to feel part of something um, rather than just turning up to do a job from nine till five in terms of the platform itself, um, there are multiple products, some of which are released, some of which are, are on the way. Um, Viva Engage uh, previously was Yammer, um, but that's giving people kind of a community aspect to that. Um, we've got Viva Insights, which is yeah, there's two flavours to it. There's personal insights, which some of you may get the, the daily digest um, through in your inbox, showing you how much time you're spending in meetings, how often you're logging in out of hours. Um, and who you're interacting with and how, how best to utilize your time. Um, we've got uh, Viva Goals, um, which allows uh, kind of the uh, objectives and key results methodology to be brought into Microsoft Teams and into the way people are working. So it shows people how their contribution to organizational goals fit in and how, you know, how their success is reflected in the, the bigger picture. Um, and then we've got Viva Topics and Viva Learning, which is where we can we can start to, to bring people um, information from around the business, but also structured learning, which can be uh, embedded with third party suppliers such as LinkedIn Learning and a few others so that they can actually have objectives and courses to achieve. And that can be linked back into goals to show how by doing those pieces of learning, by increasing their own personal um, knowledge base, they're actually contributing to the organisational goals as well. So uh, Viva is powered by Microsoft 365 and the Microsoft Graph. It's integrated, it's secure, um, it brings you data from within your organization um, and it enables people to have a real outlook on, on where they're going um, and, and what they're doing. Um, it fits within the flow of work um, and it, it pulls all of the data and the telemetry that Microsoft have got on what people are doing, but what the organization is doing to provide real value. And then from a from a business impact, um, it should reduce labor costs by uh, retaining rather than recruiting, as mentioned earlier. It can help you um, build people in terms of succession planning. So it just start to build people towards the next role in their development and, and enable them to, to develop personally. Um, it can actually speed up how people are working by making um, collaboration quicker and easier and better and making people more aligned to corporate goals. Um, and then the, the other bits at the bottom, you know, we've mentioned already around increasing engagement um, and reducing internal costs. Um, and then just quickly on Copilot, um, a lot of people may have heard a lot of things about Microsoft Copilot. Um, this is uh, basically an AI driven assistant for people in the flow of work. Um, so it uses large language models, so you can ask it questions in, in natural language. It can understand what you're doing, it can respond. It uses Microsoft Graph, so it's fully based on corporate data. The, the co-pilot model is restricted to your own data. You don't get you know, any cross contamination with other organizations data. It learns and it, it works for your organization and it works within the Microsoft 365 apps. So as you'd expect, those apps are the, the standard office apps. Um, so, you, you know, within Word, within Excel, within PowerPoint, you, you've got those things available to you. You can ask it questions. It can help you to, to dr drive out content. So one of the examples within Word, for example, is you've written a long document and you can just ask Copilot to write an executive summary for you and it'll fill it out. Um, so it just makes those pit, those bits a bit quicker for you, a bit easier to do. Um, there's also the concept of business chat, um, which has been announced in the last few months, um, which essentially is just a chatbot, which you can go and ask it questions about your organization. It works across all your data, all of your applications to find you the most relevant answers. It's got access to your business content and context, so it will tell you about people within your organization if it sees fit. It will tell you about your processes, your data. It's not cross contaminating that with other things and other people. Uh, again, it's built on Microsoft's approach to security, compliance, privacy, and that's why it's all uh, within your enterprise estate and not going outside of that. Um, and it's built around the ethical, uh, responsible AI framework. So it's designed 
to unleash creativity, unlock productivity and up level skills. Um, and like we said, it's grounded in your business data. It's secure. It's integrated into the apps you use every day. Um, it gives people the ability to stay in control of what they want to use, what they don't want to use. And it's designed to help you learn new skills, but it's also designed to le learn new skills itself, which is the artificial intelligence part of it. It will become more useful the, the longer it's in play. Um, so there's a, a lot of benefits to it. Information on the platform itself is relatively sparse. We've got a few examples if people would like to, to investigate that a bit more. Um, but given the uh, the costings that were announced for it yesterday, I imagine it's going to be a little bit high for, for a lot of people. But in the not-for-profit sector, they haven't announced what that's going to look like. So it, it could be that with not-for-profit pricing, this is something which can be really revolutionary within that industry, depending on how that lands. So in terms of next steps following the content we've put out today, um, if you have an existing partner that, that deals with your licensing, which deals with, with helping you roadmap, please talk to them. Please make sure you're getting the value from them that, that you think you should be getting. If you don't have a trusted advisor currently, if you don't have a partner, please come and talk to us. We're more than happy to have those conversations, see where we can provide value into your organisation and where we can help you. Um, all we'd advise you is that you start planning ahead. A lot of people get to things like license renewals um, and it creeps up all too quickly, um, particularly with third party product renewals where they'll just send you an invoice a month before it's due and you don't have time to plan on that consolidation piece. So if you know when those dates are, when those are coming up, you can start to plan ahead um, and just understand where your commitments and opportunities are. So again, those contract end dates, those products that you're using that potentially you're not getting the full benefit from um, and where you've got opportunities to to further utilise product sets that, that you potentially uh, need to know about, feel free to come and talk to, to us or another Microsoft partner um, and we'll get you into the, the right place. So I'll just leave our company details up there now for anybody that would like to, uh, to get in touch with us. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for your time uh, listening to, to me waffle on this morning. Um, we will have a look at the questions and answers in just a second. Pete, that was fantastic. Thank you. So much information there. And I think a really timely reminder, actually, that a lot of the complexity of Microsoft licensing can be reduced if you take a step back and you look at your own needs as an organisation before you even start thinking about licensing. Um, it, it's kind of walk before you try and run isn't it really and you've got to go yeah, back absolutely. to basics and understand your own needs uh, now we have got lots of really good questions coming in um so much so that i'm going to hold mine back until the end actually <laughs> because I, I want to make sure that you know people who've attended can get their questions answered so i'm going to work through them just in the order that they've come in oh and i can see the number flying up now Everybody suddenly started posting them. All right, so first one, um, which entity gives us the inactive user report? Um, we run this, but users shown as inactive on a usage report, log on exchange showing 365 admin as having a recent login. Yeah. Any thoughts on that one? Yeah, so Microsoft have, uh, it used to be kind of a, a PowerShell command that would give you the most accurate information. Microsoft are moving that towards Graph API now. So you'll, you'll, you'll get information from Graph API, which isn't available in Azure AD. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is how we can bring that information into something that we can export based on unmanaged customers. Um, but similarly, not just uh, information that we can export, but potentially start to automate those processes based on those inactive users. So touched on it a little bit in the in the presentation, um, but ultimately it's the graph API calls which are going to give you the most accurate information. Sorry, I I think I dropped out of the call then, so I missed a lot of your answer then, Pete. Apologies. <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was you or me, Trey. Uh, I don't know. I think it was me. Um, so apologies for that. Did you get to finish your your response there? Yes, I carried on regardless. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. OK, thank you for that. I'm sorry I missed that one. Um, 
Uh, another question come in. There doesn't seem to be a clear way to find where users have not logged in or authenticated in 30 days plus. That's come from Matt H. Yeah, so uh, again, those are going to be um, pulled from the Graph API. Um, so it's not visible in Azure AD, um, but via the Graph API, we can pull reports and we can we can schedule those um, and we can get those kind of exports out. What we do say is even though you know the last login date, the last sign in time, for example, has been pulled um, as being over that time, we still think that list needs to be validated before any action is taken. Um, and sometimes it could be that people have processes that run in their name. So the last sign in time should always be interactive sign ins and you can decipher between interactive and non interactive within Azure AD. Um, but it's just worth doing a bit of due diligence to make sure that those sign ins are accurate. Brilliant, thank you. Um, this is a bit, bit longer question here, a bit more complex this one uh, from Luke. Thank you, Luke. We are looking at changing our antivirus from Sophos Central to Defender for Business that is included with our business premium license. How does Defender for Business licensing work for on-prem Windows servers and Azure Windows servers? My guess is there will be some sort of license required through an agent. Yeah, so there's a product uh, which is Defender for Servers. In essence, um, it, within Microsoft speak, it forms part of a wider product called Defender for Cloud. Um, now, despite the fact it's called Defender for Cloud, it does still apply to on-prem servers as well, um, but that will put a, a license Defender for usage on those servers. The way that works is that's actually based as an Azure service on a consumption model. So the agent which is deployed to those servers will check in at you know um, when it's booted and when it's shut down. So you only actually pay for that defender coverage whilst the server is active. So if you've got something which is is turned on at certain points of the day, or you've got something for you know AVD for example to to expand capacity at peak times, then you won't have to pay for that server 24/7. You'll just pay for it when it's in use. Brilliant. Luke, I hope that answers your question OK for you. If not, post a follow up uh, in the Q&A and we'll come back to it. Thank you, Pete. Um, Matt from Independent Age, different Matt now, is has got another lengthy question for you and then a couple of follow ups on this one. Um, so we need to license our virtual desktops and we're using VDA licenses in the past, but want to use CSP to enable us to change the licenses numbers when needed. Um, thought we needed to just buy Windows Enterprise E3 licenses for each, but have been told it's just an add on license. Can you clarify what might be needed? Currently have E1, Apps for Enterprise, Defender for 365, Plan 2 and Mobility and Security E5. Um, and Matt says, understand this might only be relevant to us to happy, so happy to speak offline, but I think probably this is going to be quite insightful for, for a lot of people. So Pete, again, over to you. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, there, there is a, a, a few moving parts there in, in terms of, you know, what infrastructure you're using to run um, virtual desktop estates, um, for example. Um, I'm not sure. Did that say it was using AVD or was it just virtual desktops? Um, and we're using video license and pass. Oh, not sure. We okay, need to so, license our virtual desktops and we're using yeah. VDA licenses in the past, but want to use CSP. OK. OK, yeah, I mean. So in terms of um, those questions, it's it's about licensing the servers that the, VD, uh, the VDI instances are going to run on. It's also about then licensing the desktops that people are, are physically using. So if that's coming through Microsoft Azure and the, you know those servers are being run, then Windows licensing can be included in those. Um, if we're running AVD, again, the license is included within the consumption model. If we're running on, you know, a, a VMware or a Citrix environment, then the licensing can be completely different. So there's a lot of moving parts there, um, and I'm more than happy to get a conversation in place with one of our guys on the Azure side that are much more uh, akin to, to those other technologies than I am. Thank you. Matt's just clarified AVD and virtual desktops. OK, um, yeah. More than happy to to have that chat with with Matt um, as necessary. Thank you. He's then got another question, much more straightforward. This one, I think. What license do we need for all the Viva tools? What is it included with? Okay, so Viva itself 
um, is is a, is a separate license. Um, so Viva Suite to get all of it um, is a separate license. Each one of those components can be licensed individually. And within an E3 or a business premium license, you get Viva Connections and the start of Viva Learning. So it gives you a bit of the learning content, but it's centered around MS Learn content and you can publish internal learning content. If you want to integrate an, uh, an existing LMS learning management system, then the, the Viva Learning as part of Viva Suite will enable you to do that. But Viva Connections, which enables you to do a bit of kind of uh, employee engagement, outreach, uh, intranet type stuff and bring that into Teams is included within the base level. Brilliant, thank you. Um, there's a lot of thank yous coming through on the questions now, by the way, so I think uh, you are really helping people out with some great answers here um, from anonymous now. Sorry, don't know who this one is. So we have a mixture of CSP, EA, direct purchase and multiple sub orgs with the ability to add to each and all. Would you recommend a consolidated approach to licensing such as a global EA so we have better insight and overall visibility? Yes. Is the simple answer. Um, simplicity is absolutely key because it's a financial investment. You've got a lot of ongoing management. So the simplest way you can do that, the better. However, there is often a use case for more than one scenario. So what we have seen in a lot of instances is an organization that has a core functionality on an EA because they can look in the price and they know what they're getting. They're getting the benefits of being on an EA. On top of that EA, they've then got a CSP because they've got seasonal requirements or they've got flexible requirements where they know they're going to have that that requirement to, to increase and decrease licensing almost at will. So with the bit of flexibility they need, they'll put that on a CSP and they'll happily pay a little bit more because then the total cost of ownership is actually less to pay a little bit more per license across those seats that are flexible than pay for everything on an EA across the whole piece. So if you can get away with you know, a global EA to do everything, that's great. You get all of the benefits of the EA. If you've got flexibility requirements, get those into a CSP. If you can, you then get, you know, if the, the same provider can do both for you, you still get the simplicity with billing. If they can't, you get the benefit of having two partners to ask questions to. Fantastic, thank you. That sort of um, leads into one of my questions, actually, which is that, you know, there's obviously clear benefits to working with a partner on the yeah. licensing, but I know that's not going to be an option for all organisations um, for various reasons. What would be the sort of top one or two tips that you would give people if they're having to manage this internally themselves without the benefit of a partner? Um, I mean, there is likely to be a partner for everybody if they want it. Um, so there's, there's different levels of partner, there's different sizes of partners and, and different partners are better placed to support different organisations of different sizes. The benefits of using a partner means that you get the benefit of their experience, their expertise and the fact they're doing this across multiple organisations. If you don't want to or you, you know, you're happy with the direct uh, arrangements with Microsoft or you just don't know where to go to, to choose the right partner and you, you need to manage that yourself, then the most important thing is just to be able to look ahead, to look at, at what you've got in your license, where you're spending your money when your renewals are up and just make sure you're trying to, to make that as efficient as possible. Um, and similarly, knowing what's coming down the track from Microsoft is really difficult. Um, if you search for Microsoft 365 roadmap, they do publish upcoming changes. It can be a bit of a minefield. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there. It changes so frequently that one of the other things that is absolutely worth doing is just looking at the websites of multiple Microsoft partners, seeing where they're running webinars, seeing where they've got content which they are pushing out into the community, because it's very important for us as a partner to be giving back out into the community, to be sharing knowledge, to be sharing expertise, um, and you know, pro providing that value that, that we can, because we know that a lot of organisations don't have the time or the resource to be looking through all of those resources. So, so try and take benefits of those partners, even if you're not transacting with them. And via that way, you will find yourself gravitating towards somebody, asking questions uh, and trying to uh, trying to get near to, to, to an agreement that you can have. Thank you. We've got another question 
that's uh, that's just popped in at the bottom now um, and I'm very aware of the time so this is probably going to be the last one that we can address uh, live this morning. CSPS can't seem to get anywhere near the business premium charity price. Thoughts? So as part of the CSP price book we do have access to the not-for-profit prices so we, we can absolutely deliver um, business premium licensing at charity pricing at not-for-profit price um, so if, if somebody's telling you that's not possible I'd be interested to to speak to you a bit further and understand kind of what's going on there um, what I will say is the um, the charity pricing um, that, that Microsoft recommend and that some licensing service providers provide may be different so some people do come in under the price which is published as the charity price. So you may be seeing somebody has, has, has kind of taken a, a decision to, to push that at a lower price point. And what you're actually seeing from CSPs is the actual Microsoft recommended price. Um, so it'd be interesting to, to understand what the what the evidence for that would be. Fantastic. Thank you, Pete. Um, OK, let's wrap up questions there. But as Pete has said, very happy to speak to people independently of this call. So if you have got queries, if you want to explore some of the questions that were asked here this morning in a bit more detail, then please do reach out. Uh, I, I said it at the beginning, I can't say it strongly enough. We absolutely trust Cloud Direct working with them as a partner on webinars and workshops like this because we know they're going to give you the best advice and that advice is not necessarily going to be a sell for them. Um, Pete has talked this morning and, and been really open about the benefits of working with partners but not necessarily with Cloud Direct so that's why we love working with them on these webinars because we know they give you a really impartial perspective. So Thank you to Pete and thank you to Adam as well, who's who's hiding with his video off and the audio off, uh, who organised all of this and put it all together. It, I think it's been a fantastic workshop and I hope that you've all found it really useful as well. Um, what have we got coming in now? Resellers charge tax, Microsoft doesn't, somebody has said. OK, well, you know, <laughs> we can't really discuss that one here because we've run out of time, but uh, thank you for the contribution there. Um, we would love to do more of these workshops and webinars, so please, if there is a topic that you'd like us to cover, let us know, either contact me or contact Adam. Adam, I am going to put you on the spot now and ask you to come off or uh, come off mute because I know you are going to be preparing a document to go out to attendees, aren't you? Can you just say a little bit about what that is and when it might be ready? Yeah, hi Tree, thanks for that. Yeah, sorry I've been quiet the whole way through that. Nobody really wants to hear my voice as part of this. <laughs> but um, yeah, we will be preparing a one or two page document to accompany this uh, workshop today, kind of just highlighting some of the key uh, resources, tips and stuff that Pete went through today. Um, so what we can do is we'll hand that over to you at CITL to share between your members who joined today and to everybody else that joined the webinar today as well in the next couple of weeks. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, well, that's brought us in bang on 12 o'clock. So thank you for that, Adam. You have now enabled us to end spot on time. And um, Pete, just a huge, huge thank you again for your time, not only this morning, but in pulling all of this together. Been a really in-depth and very, very accessible as well, actually, run through Microsoft licensing and hopefully really helpful for everyone who has attended. Thank you to everyone who took the time out of your, I have no doubt, hugely busy days to come and, and spend the time with us and for posting your questions and your thoughts and comments. And it just remains for me to say thank you again and we hope to see you on the next one. Whatever that topic will be, let us know what you want to hear about. So thank you very much and thank you Pete, thank you Adam. And farewell, everyone.